Welcome to an information session for the Penn Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences program. Welcome, good morning. My name is Chris Nave. I'm the Associate Director of the program here at Penn. I'm excited to spend the next hour or so with, with many of you um, to discuss more of the program. Um, this is an interactive um, ver uh, information session, and so you have the opportunity to ask questions towards the end, um, and, and you can have to queue up some questions um, throughout the, the time here. So you can use the chat feature um, if you're watching this through YouTube. Um, and so to kind of kick things off, um, how about you tell me where you are streaming from currently? Um, so if you can use your chat feature box, let me know where you are um, streaming from. We'll get started with the, the program. And while I'm waiting for people to kind of to let us know where they're streaming from, um, we're going to cover a little bit on the curriculum. We're going to highlight a lot of new information about our students and where they're coming from, what they're doing, um, what kinds of jobs they're getting into uh, afterwards. We'll talk a little bit about the accolades and things that are going on with them. And so we'll kind of go through that process. Okay, great. So we have them coming in. So welcome from Germany and Charlottesville, Virginia, and Dubai and Boston and Michigan, Philly and Vail, Colorado. Somebody from the UK, a couple people from Philly, San Diego. Very early in San Diego. Thank you for waking up with us. Uh, Minnesota, so welcome everybody. Um, so uh, as I will continue, but um, please feel free to let us know where you're, you're streaming from as I go through this. So um, the MBDS program is um, the main purpose that we have is really kind of threefold. Um, we're trying to understand the process behind decision making. We're looking at ways um, to create sustainable behavior change. And then we're also looking to translate academic research into actionable insights. And so this is a, a kind of a defining feature of behavioral science, behavioral and decision science. Um, we're taking a lot of what is out there in, in data science and other industries and in, in psychology and political science and economics and behavioral economics. We're taking a lot of the theory, the quantitative rigor, uh, and we're applying that, we're putting it together to try to create this sustainable behavior change and try to better understand how, how people make decisions. Um, we have a, a threefold curriculum here. So we have a theoretical basis, a quantitative basis, and applied basis. So and we want to make sure that students are equipped with um, the, the most kind of robust theories across all academic disciplines. So we want to break down those academic silos. My background is in psychology. I learned a lot in social psychology and personality psychology. But I didn't know, I, I had very little exposure to political science or how economics, economists and uh, behavioral econ economists and others um, looked at the world. And so our students come from a wide variety of backgrounds and our curriculum also makes sure that students have um, broad theoretical frameworks that they can use to better understand decision making and, and behavior change. We definitely have a very rigorous quantitative component. We want to make sure that students at least have a deep appreciation for measurement, um, um, design, evaluation, um, understanding things like data science, how to model, at least having a pre again a pre an appreciation for modeling data. Um, can you interpret what a data scientist or a, a quantitative team is doing? And can you um, interpret it for a wider audience? Can you interpret it for policymakers, for executives? Um, that's definitely a big uh, focus and feature of our program. And then we have an applied component. We want to make sure that what you're doing in the classroom translates into something outside of the classroom. So we have a lot of opportunities for you to demonstrate your knowledge, whether it's through design challenges, through our um, uh, capstone process, uh, internships, and many, many more opportunities. So welcome. So we have people still letting us know We're coming from Tokyo and uh, Indonesia and Washington and Turkey. Great, welcome. Um, so I wanted to share with you a quote from our faculty and founding director, Christina Bicchieri. 
and she notes that participating in this unique interdisciplinary program will prepare you to face the multiple challenges of modeling, measuring, and intervening on social behaviors in a variety of real-world contexts, um, both local and global. And so to kind of unpack a bit of that, this is a, a very unique interdisciplinary program. Um, we're a one year, one calendar year program. We're housed in the School of Arts and Sciences. So we're not within a business school, we're not in a policy school. Um, we have a very, very broad framework um, that students can get in behavioral science that they can then apply um, to a wide variety of domains. And you'll see kind of the variability of our students and their backgrounds and the types of jobs that they want to get afterwards. So um, MBDS students, there's a few things that we hope by the time that you're done with us that you'll be able to do. And so um, a, a few of them are, are up here. So one of them really is translating academic content into actionable deliverables. This is something that a lot of the specialized academics, those with PhDs that, that do a lot of research training, they may have a very narrow focus and they may be unable to kind of communicate their work um, into something actionable that could be kind of usable, whether it's for city government or for um, a company that's trying to you know, better understand the cu customer experience, that's where our students can come in. They can translate that dense academic work and figure out how it can be um, turned into an intervention or some kind of a, a policy um, going forward. Our students can design lab and field experiments to test hypotheses. They can learn to model how individuals and groups make decisions. Um, they can get into the behavioral and neural foundations of decision making. They can create and analyze computational models of social emergence. And then they can use network analysis to understand how behavior can spread or dissolve. And network analysis is a really kind of hot area these days. Um, our program focuses a lot on collective behavior change. So the fact that we don't make decisions in a vacuum, I don't make a decision about whether or not to go to a doctor on my own necessarily. I have a wife and son and, and other people that influence my decision. And we can map that out through a, a process called network analysis. We can see who are the influencers in my decision making process. And if we understand that, we can better create sustainable behavior change, better understand how people make decisions. So that is a, definitely a, a, a unique area of focus for our students and our program. We have, we are in our third year, and um, after listening to our advisory board and listening to our students, the, the kind of fun part of a new program and a new field of behavioral science is we get to iterate. And so um, our curriculum has changed a little bit uh, this year, in 2019. We have now have five core classes. Um, you still get three electives. The three electives can be taken anywhere on campus, and we'll kind of get to that in a minute. But for the five core classes, um, here's what they are. We, we have a, a, a method-based class on behavioral economics, so you really get into the methods and measurement um, of the process. You go through Am using Am Amazon uh, MTurk and Qualtrics, and you um, design a group project together, and an extension of academic work, and you really try to work through how that extension may be useful um, outside the lab. We have a, a, a social norms class that, that we're, we're now going to be calling a norms and nudges. It, it gets at the collective behavior change component, but also gets at what a lot of people are familiar with in behavioral science and behavioral economics, the nudge and nudge-based approaches. And so the, the course will broadly cover both what nudges are and when they're successful and useful and when social norms, social norms messaging is, is more maybe impactful. And they actually, there's a thing called norm nudging that you can use that where you're kind of highlighting both features um, to, to better impact uh, behavior change. We have a public policy and applications course that even if you are not wanting to go into public policy, it's really, really important to have an appreciation for um, policy and, and how, um, how they are created how they get implemented, and how they get evaluated. Uh, most companies, especially larger corporations, have a component where they are working um, in the nonprofit space. They're teaming up on important initiatives and having an awareness of that. So whether it's financial literacy um, or environmental concerns, uh, it's, it's a component to see how behavioral science may influence um, this field. It's an important component. And then we also have uh, judgments and decisions. 
So it's really, really crucial for our students, um, people that graduate from our program, to understand all the different biases, heuristics, and processes that go on during the, uh, the decision-making process. And so you get a lot of cognitive and social psychology principles um, put into that class. And then finally, you have a quantitative core that you can choose um, one of the following. You can either take a statistical reasoning class. That statistical reasoning um, course is done exclusively in R. R is an, a free um, a platform that you can use that a, a lot of companies are using, a lot of nonprofits and NGOs are using to analyze data, to create um, really nice uh, visual displays of data. And so you can say by the end of your time in the statistical reasoning course that, that you um, have proficiency in R. Um, it's not expected that you have any before you join the course, but by the end you'll, you'll feel pretty um, familiar and comfortable with it. We also have a data science and quantitative modeling class. And this is a unique course where you're really getting into translating what data scientists are doing. And so you're doing things like um, first understanding uh, AI, and machine learning and, and some of the different principles that go on there, but you're also getting into all of the different ways that um, analysts, quantitative analysts, um, um, data science teams can analyze data and model data, and you'll learn about the pros and cons of the different approaches so that you're better informed. Um, you can also better translate the kind of the dense output from a lot of the, the, the data scientist teams that kind of create these reports, you're going to be the one likely to turn it into the one-page deliverable, the best visual display, the graphical display that may, that may convince you know, um, uh, upper management or executives, policymakers to maybe create a, a new change or a new program within a, within a particular company or field. Um, I'm highlighting how truly interdisciplinary our program is. So f in our second cohort, we had students take classes all over the campus um, from a number of different schools. And these are, um, uh, there's 114 unique courses that students took all over, including at places like the Wharton School, the School of Arts and Sciences, the School of Social Policy and Practice, uh, Graduate School of Education, the School of Medicine, uh, communications, uh, engineering, nursing, and the School of Design. So our students are getting very, very broad um, electives that they can use. Each student can take three electives. They can be anywhere on campus. We don't have any one prescribed path that students um, have to go with their electives. Um, most of our students are not coming as blank slates. You all have experience from undergrad, um, your undergraduate time, from maybe internships, Maybe you have um, years of experience in industry. Um, we, we are aware of that and we mentor and work with you in our advising process to see what, might, what, might, um, what are some gaps that you may have that we can better um, kind of plug by certain kinds of classes. So what skill sets do you want to have? Are you looking to make a transition or a pivot um, from your current work that you're doing into another area? And what are some of the identifiable skills or knowledge bases that you need to kind of get to that, that pivot? And so we'll work with you. It might mean that you're taking a, a finance class paired with a communications class, paired with a policy class. Um, it might mean that you're taking all three classes um, that are more framework oriented, like design thinking um, and some of the other different approaches. Um, here's a sample of classes that our students, um, that are fairly popular with our students over the first two years. And so design thinking or integrated product design program, um, a lot of students do that, or need finding is another one. These are giving you some qualitative frameworks um, to think about uh, people and how they interact with, with products and the environment around them. Um, we have students take uh, several classes from the organizational dynamics program here at Penn, including a, another kind of framework oriented class like art, the art of divergent thinking. Um, we have a number of students taking a behavioral economics and health class that's really, really popular with uh, Allison Butenheim on, ca on campus. We have the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics here at Penn, um, very, very cutting edge, and seeing how the behavioral economics principles get applied into the healthcare sector uh, is, is a really, really important contribution that Penn has, and our students have access to that, which is really exciting. There's a behavioral finance class that a lot of students um, uh, at least look into, especially if they're looking in the finance domain that Wharton offers. Um, th there are other interesting classes in like sociology and demography that students take. 
Um, here's a, a few others that you can kind of see. So evidence-based crime prevention, uh, if that's kind of an area of, of interest for you, that's offered through the criminology, but there's also law school um, courses that you can take. You can take an intro to energy policy, um, a modeling choice behavior class, predictive analytics if you want to go more on the quantitative path. Uh, you can take a modern data mining class to kind of round out your other core classes that you're taking with us as well. And again, these are just samples. We had 114 unique courses last year alone. Um, the Penn catalog has a thousand or more classes that you can really choose from um, that, that we work very closely with you to advise you on, on what might be the best options. Um, we had a busy year um, in, in 2019 alone, where we had a, a number of different representatives from companies visit campus to talk specifically with our students. Um, and these are um, companies that are either exclusively behavioral science oriented or that have behavioral science components that are, are beginning to be more and more embedded in their company. So you have like one of the originators in behavioral science, the behavioral insights team um, that, that works um, pretty closely with us. We have um, Ideas42, which can, you could kind of think of as like a boutique consultancy firm, um, that one of the originators in this behavioral science field. Um, RARES in, in the conservation field, they do a lot of behavioral science as it applies to sustainable fishing and farming. Um, People Science, it's a, it's a good website where there's a, a lot of content about behavioral science is applied more to like the workplace. Um, that uh, Jeff Chrysler, um, who's a co-author of uh, Dan Ariely's Dollars and Cents book, uh, is the ex uh, editor-in-chief of. Um, we have had representatives from the Center for Health Incentives and Behavioral Economics visit us, the Center for Advanced Hindsight, um, and the Behavioral Science team at Allstate, um, among others. So we have a, um, we don't meet every single week for professional development, but our students, it's kind of mandated that we have two or three times a month we meet, we bring in speakers to kind of talk with us about behavioral science. So they'll give you realistic job previews about what it's like to be in a role like what they have or what they're looking for in candidates for positions that they may be um, having internships or jobs for. Um, we do a lot of career, we work a lot with career services on campus. Penn has a really, really great career services where you can um, get advising on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile, how to network effectively. And that benefit through Penn Career Services is something that you have forever. So even after you leave the program, if you want to make a pivot or you, you're looking for a promotion and you want to kind of um, justify that, you can work with our, our Career Services as a Penn alum to help get you those skills that you need. Um, last year was the first year for us to really kind of go all in on these design challenges. Um, really exciting. We worked with four different companies. So we worked with Microsoft, Prudential, Benefits Data Trust, and Ipsos. So very different companies, very different um, uh, objectives in different spaces like tech and insurance and marketing and um, policy. And so um, about 75% um, three-fourths of our students took part in at least one design challenge and for about eight weeks in the spring term we have we, we partner um, students up in, in teams they work with a contact at one of these companies they have an, a clear set of deliverables of what they're supposed to be doing so it might be something as simple as um, kind of um, literature review and, and making some recommendations for where they should go next. It might be designing a pilot study. It might be analyzing some data that they've been sitting on and they don't really know what to do with. Um, and so they, they vary in terms of how quantitative they are, how um, strategy oriented they might be, or how, or it may be some that you're helping on the kind of the implementation stage of it. These are great because you can, you can showcase the skill sets that you have and the, the content that you've learned from the classroom and, and you know, show it to a particular company. Um, the likelihood of them wanting to work with you afterwards, whether it's through an internship, whether it's through our capstone process or maybe through a job, it increases because they know you, they've seen the quality of your work. And even if you don't want to work officially with any of these companies going forward, you have this in your portfolio. So in addition to the knowledge base that you're getting um, from our classes, you can show that you've participated in these internal and external design challenges, and you sh you're showing your thought process. 
What was the slide deck that you used? How did you attempt to solve a problem for a particular company? That's an important set of skills that you can bring um, to the job market. And as a more professionally based program, um, you know, I'd say 80, 90 percent of our students are looking to go into industry right away, um, right after, our, at least right as their next step. And so that's important for us to have in addition to our normal um, uh, academic curriculum. Um, showing a, um, a tweet from our, our new newest uh, instructor that we, we designed this really cool consulting class. So we're having a consulting in the behavioral science course. Um, this spring, we're piloting it with 20 students with, from diverse backgrounds. And it's going to be a really, really, really deep dive into the consulting process, how consulting and behavioral science are interrelated. And um, we are going to work very hard to make sure that, that by the end of that course, that, uh, again, the skill sets that you have with whether it's the softer skills like teamwork, communication, um, those kinds of components, or the kind of strategic thinking um, being exposed to all of the different frameworks, or at least many of the different frameworks that are out there. So how does a place like the Behavioral Insights team solve problems? How does, um, we use, they use the EAST framework, and they kind of, we walk through that through this, this course. How does Ideas42 or Rare or some of these other different companies, how do they attempt to solve problems that might be behavioral? And so by the end of the course, you will have a, a better, uh, a deeper appreciation and, and awareness of all these different frameworks. You'll have practice using them. You'll get a lot of practice in the kind of softer skills and teamwork. You'll be working with companies to provide, again, some kind of actionable deliverable um, at the end of that. And that is something that we will have um, going forward um, for our students that want to join us uh, in future years. I'm also really, really excited to be a part of uh, the Action Design Network. And so we are in the Philadelphia chapter, we, we, the 13th or 14th city that Action Design has. Action Design is a nonprofit um, that was co-created by Steve Wendell at Morningstar and, and, and others. Um, it's a really, really great opportunity for our students to network with people in Philly and the Philadelphia-based area. Um, on a number of really important and interesting topics in behavioral science. This is also a great opportunity for our alumni to come back and give presentations as behavioral science um, experts or leaders, as thought leaders. This is a really, really great practice for our current students to help either design um, and, and decide who to invite for these types of meetups um, or practice talking to a, a, a non-academic audience. So we work through meetup.com. We have our own Action Design um, Philly group. We have about 270 members right now and growing. We just started a few months ago. You're welcome, particularly if you're in the Philly-based area. You can find us on meetup.com if you type in Action Design Philly. You can request access, and you can see the different types of events that we do. We just concluded with a, a health panel about how to make health interventions smarter. It was a really, really great panel that we did in September, and we had um, four um, practitioners, well, we had uh, one practitioner and three researchers from a variety of different backgrounds um, really share their insights. So how do physicians trained in, in decision science think how uh, interventions might be better designed? How do those train more in public health um, or that work for Ideas42 um, or work in implementation science? How do they think um, what kinds of strategies and tips might be effective in, in making interventions smarter uh, and more efficient? This is something also, too, that our students can take part in, the, the designing, and, and um, we have committees, student-based committees that students can be a part of. So um, a number of you may be familiar with our, our web page. Um, I'm highlighting some of the elements from our web page. So this is some of our affiliated faculty. You'll scroll down and you'll see that we have about a dozen of them. I'm really excited. I would say check our affiliated page in the next few weeks. We have a couple new um, faculty members that are hyper relevant to behavioral science that will be joining us um, on the page and we'll make announcements on our social media. But we have, for example, our founding director, Christina Bicchieri. We have Jonathan Barron, who's as an emeritus. He's one of the um, pioneers of the judgment and decision-making cognitive psychology uh, movement. Um, and Renad Bidas, who is um, really, really uh, kind of rock star in implementation science, which is this 
pre-intervention design. So before all of this money gets wasted in doing an intervention that, that was kind of designed poorly, can we get buy-in um, from a diverse audience for the, for the, the people that we intend to serve um, before we create the intervention to make sure that we're, we're going to do it effectively, that it can be sustainable going forward. And so uh, among, ver among others, we have a, a really great affiliated faculty that work with our students in a variety of ways. So they may be teaching courses with our students, they may be um, coming to our professional development research meetings, they may be supervising our students for our capstone processes. Um, we also have a number of current instructors that teach um, other courses for us. So um, one would be Nazli Bhatia. Nazli is an award-winning teacher and instructor on campus. She's also an expert in negotiation and strategy. She teaches two very, very popular classes with us. She teaches a negotiation behavior class, and then she teaches a power, persuasion, and influence class for our students. And the, these classes really help you kind of in the applied space. So how do you do uh, the buyer-seller transactions? Which tips and strategies work and are, are effective? And the thing that she does that, that business schools and other areas don't necessarily cover in their curriculum is she gets into the why. So why might these strategies be effective? What does the psychology literature and other literature say that is the mechanism behind why these different strategies or influence tactics may be effective? Um, Eugen Demott teaches our methods and policy, uh, our, our methods and measures class. Um, he is a number of uh, years of experience designing experimental uh, behavioral economics uh, uh, research programs, and so he teaches our students really how how to go about with the research process, um, how to read and interpret empirical articles, how to write referee reports. Um, he has students going to a number of experimental um, and non-experimental talks on campus and writing them up and, and discussing them as a group. He has students looking at academic research and thinking of logical extensions. What would be an interesting next step? And is it something that we could scale and actually do a pilot of on campus throughout the duration of a semester? And what might, why might it be important to look at? Um, Enrique Fatas is another instructor. He, tends, he teaches our public policy class. Enrique is a, a, just a full professor at um, Lodeboro uh, in the UK, and he also teaches um, uh, with them. He does a lot of research in behavioral economics, policy, and finance. Um, we also have uh, Ed Roisman. Ed Roisman um, teaches, uh, has been teaching at Penn for a number of years. He was trained by Jonathan Barron and Paul Rosin, very, very famous um, psychology experts in decision science. And um, Ed has had a great career in academia and research and in teaching um, judgment and decision making. It's a very popular class that our students take. And then um, finally, one of our current instructors right now is uh, Alex Spenev. He um, has a, a master's degree in um, demography, uh, statistics from Wharton, and he has a PhD in demography, and he teaches our stats class and our data science class. And he also is one of our, the kind of the leading experts on campus in network analysis. So he really understands the collective behavior change, how to model and map it. And he's working with um, the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral, Dyna uh, Behavioral Dynamics on campus um, that Christina Bicchieri is the founder of. Um, that works with companies and nonprofits around the world, looking at um, specifically Alex's contribution is the network analysis um, and data analysis component to it. I um, want to highlight the, kind of the capstone process. So the capstone experience, our students, you take eight classes in the program with us, and then there's that final ninth um, independent study, you can kind of think of it like an independent study where you're working with somebody from campus. Um, it could be somebody that you've taken a class with that you really, um, you know, value their, their skills and their knowledge, or it could be somebody else that would be very, very useful to a topic that you're looking to explore. And they, they mentor you throughout the process, and you're writing something for a more external and broader audience. You're not writing a dense academic thesis. You're writing either a, a consultant report, an impact report, um, a white paper. Um, it might be a, like a handbook for how to, to um, leverage behavioral insights into a particular company. So um, it can be more consultant report oriented, more technical. 
Um, and it's really, again, meant to be for a wider audience. So is, is this something that you could show a future job um, um, or people that are behind behavioral scientists or people science and they would find what you wrote really, really interesting and useful? It also will have a rigorous component so that academics and researchers will, will you know, be able to follow and go through and see um, you know, that you've accurately discussed their, their theories and um, uh, evaluated the research kind of effectively and, and figured out ways to bring it into industry. Um, I'm highlighting just a sample, a, a, a small handful of the capstone projects that were recently completed over this summer of our second cohort. Um, so you'll see how variable they are. There are a lot of different topics because our students come from a wide variety of backgrounds and they want to go into a wide variety of areas uh, when they leave us. So behavioral science is a toolkit for social entrepreneurs. Using behavioral science to improve digital health. Um, using behavioral science and people analytics, which is more of a HR-based uh, application. Um, behavioral science and energy. How can behavioral insights inform effective energy policy? Um, one related to fin financial services. Um, we have a, there was a behavioral science project related to U.S. Army recruiting challenges, and based off of this capstone project, um, Alex Willard, uh, who's a major in the Army, he um, is now working with the Army on um, this this very topic. So he's looking, uh, working with their marketing to figure out how they can improve some of their recruiting challenges. Um, others have studied things like the roles of cooperation for um, forecasting accuracy and team performance, how gender diversity and group performance um, relate to each other. And then there was a really cool project on, on trying to figure out how to quantify using behavioral interventions and the return on investment they might um, provide a particular company. So if there's a way that we can quantify this and show that having a behavioral science um, unit or um, set of individuals in a company will save the company um, a number of money, will we'll create some, some new solutions um, that can be implemented that could be a really great way of, of advancing the field. Um, highlighting some of, um, kind of bragging a little bit about our, our students and what they've been able to do and, and be a part of. And so um, every year Wharton, um, this, the Wharton School hosts a people analytics uh, conference. People from all over the world come to this event. Again, it tends to be more um, um, HR related. Um, and we, there are case competitions and a number of competitions that are open to students, graduate students from all over the world. People compete very, very um, um, prestigious in terms of the number of, of groups and teams that, that perform. And students in our first two cohorts won the case competitions um, in, in year one and year two. And so, um, and they're winning it because they're coming from such different backgrounds and they're teaming up together. So our most recent w um, group of winners, we had um, a student from Nigeria who was trained more in the kind of the health sector. We had somebody um, that was trained more in psychology that worked at Deloitte for a couple of years. And then we had somebody else um, that come from the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse. Uh, magazine journalism is a major, and all of them came from very, very different perspectives. They took different elective courses with us, and their, their kind of qualitative frameworks that they decided to use and their, their, their thinking behind um, the vi displays of um, data and the data visualization were unique and really clearly stood out among some of the other teams that presented uh, at the conference. Um, uh, rare, uh, rare.org hosts a, a number of um, behavioral summits and, and events and we had an event in March where we took 10 of our students to participate in a design challenge um, that was attempting to, to try to solve um, Inspira Health's um, need for their employees to, to really kind of like carpool, like how can we get our employees to, to carpool, um, to kind of be better for the environment? Are there any kinds of incentives or programs that, that the company could offer to make it more likely that, that their, their large number of employees would, would take part in carpooling? And um, we had students, as a picture from the kind of the finals. Um, we had a team of three of our students. They, they were one of three finalists, uh, finalist teams. Their group name was called Shift Happens because it was about cars. 
um, and uh, they had a, a lot of Beatles references <laughs> in it, and, and they won rave reviews. Um, they, they finished, um, they, they, they placed in the top three, and um, th they gave some really, really interesting insights on in how to maybe improve the carpooling experience for a big client, like in Spira Health. Um, every year on campus at Penn, they have the Ben Talks, Grad Ben Talks. This is similar to like a TED Talk style. Um, we've been very successful, our students have been very successful in, in being able to present um, unique takes on uh, how behavioral science can be applied. And so most recently, um, we had two students participate in the Grad Ben Talks. One of them was Connor Joyce. He presented on um, artificial intelligence and how it affects the workplace. And so this is a hot topic in like democratic debates and things that Andrew Yang and others are kind of talking about, how artificial intelligence, um, uh, um, the kind of roboticized kind of nature of, of um, the workforce may impact jobs going forward. And so Connor um, gave a really interesting and, and nuanced talk on this process. And these talks, by the way, for nuance, they have to be f about five minutes long. Um, they're short but they're supposed to be uh, impactful. And Connor won kind of best in show for professional master's programs um, for this particular presentation. And then I'm showing um, uh, our other winner, uh, Lorena Lovano um, Gavidia. She's from Peru. Um, she was um, featured very um, all over um, uh, the press in Peru for winning. She won the Audience Choice Award for her take on um, harassment in high school, sexual harassment in high school, and how social norms messaging campaigns could be really, really useful and helpful to um, you know, combat uh, harassment at a, at a really important time in um, teenagers' lives. So um, she did that, and pr those in Peru were really thrilled that she won. Um, we have a conference presence all over. We go to a lot of the top behavioral science and um, uh, business conferences. So just recently, we're at the Behavioral Exchange in London. There were 1,200 members from all over the world, including several countrywide delegations that were a part of the experience. Um, so that's a, a something that both the program and students can kind of take part in. Um, I'm, I'm showing off a little bit more. So um, Lorena um, was named a, a professional uh, a student dean scholar this year. Um, she did a lot of work on the sexual harassment and social norms. Um, and kind of what she brought to that. It was such a unique perspective that, that she, um, she won several accolades um, presented at a number of research conferences, including the Grad Ben Talks while she was with us. Um, our new cohort, our third cohort, we have about 75 students um, coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. So our most recent kind of analysis, we put this up on LinkedIn, when they come from 12 countries, over 15 different majors. We have two Fulbright scholars, one from Venezuela and one from Italy. We have an NSF graduate research fellow that has joined us. And then we have some, uh, several students, about 60% of our students are coming from industry. They're not coming right out of undergrad, it's about 40%. The remaining about 60% or so um, are coming out of industry and they're coming from very, very diverse backgrounds. Um, so I'm, I'm cherry picked some of the, the more interesting, unique ones like firefighter. We have a firefighter this year. We have a physician from Japan. We have um, several consultants and UX designers, um, senior policy analysts, accountants, and strategists, um, as well as those that have worked in geophysics and healthcare and fashion and culinary, ma culinary management, um, as well as uh, uh, several uh, entrepreneurs uh, in our program. And so you really get at kind of the rich diversity of our students. That's definitely one of the, the highlights of our program. It's the favorite part of my job is working with, uh, you know, talking to prospective students and hearing why they're interested in behavioral science, but also working with this diverse team of, of students, um, ha having them come together, work together to try to solve problems, whether it's through these design challenges, whether it's through our, our professional development meetings that we do with each other, seeing kind of how they, they connect, interact with each other, and um, um, create uh, novel approaches to problem solving. Here's a quick sampling of um, some of the universities that students from our third cohort, where they're coming from. And um, they're coming from all over the world, as you'll see. Um, maybe some of you are from here that are, that are streaming today. Um, we just recently had a, a norms and behavioral change workshop on campus. We had um, mainly academics, about 60 or so, come from all over the world to present really cutting edge work 
on um, social norms and behavioral change. But then we also had a really fun experience with a behavioral grooves podcast. So there are uh, a non-academic podcast that talks about behavioral science. They, they interview academic researchers and they, they think about ways of maybe applying their, their work to a, um, a broader audience. They give a platform for academics and researchers to talk about what they do um, that, that they might not, not normally have. So uh, really a non-academic platform. And so they were here to interview some of our students and talk more about the program and, and talk with several of the academics and researchers that were here with us. We also had a really cool panel discussion that, that the program in particular was, was in charge of sponsoring. And so we had uh, Michael Halsworth, who's the managing director for the Behavioral Insights team. We had um, Aaron Sherman, who's the vice president at Ideas42. We had Eric Thulin, who's at um, RARE, um, is a behavioral science lead at RARE. And then Anjali Chahani, who is uh, in charge of the Philadelphia Gov, Gov Lab. And so it's the behavioral science initiative that's embedded in local government. So she works in the mayor's office and they work to try to find ways to um, employ behavioral strategies, behavioral science, evidence-based strategies to improve the, the lives of, of Philly residents. So this could be things like how do we get people to recycle or utilize bike lanes um, uh, or be more active in voting. Um, and so they were talking about some of the challenges and opportunities in working with academics on behavioral science related topics. Um, we most recently, just a couple weeks ago, we were in Dickinson College and we, were, um, we had 20 students participate in a design challenge um, where we were trying to f figure out how to create more plant-based options in dining halls. And this is the winning team. They, they, they beat out um, teams from nine other um, schools from around the, the US. Um, this group was named the Nudgedables. Um, they were trying to get people to eat more plant-based options. And they were thinking about you know, using green plates, signifying that using green plates um, would be a cue to others in the dining hall that, that you were more kind of plant-based and focused. And then also Dickinson College, their color, colors are green, so it kind of also indicates school pride. So they had a, a unique take on how to potentially solve this, this um, you know, a, a climate um, social responsibility kind of issue related to um, uh, eating meat and offering more plant-based options. Okay, so I had a look at um, where our students uh, most recently from our second cohort, this is just from our second cohort, and this, this is not the full list of our students, um, but where are they getting jobs? That's, that's a very, very common question. Um, and what kind of titles are they getting? So um, some of them are getting jobs with behavioral science titles. So we have um, Connor is at Microsoft My Analytics as a behavioral scientist. We have two um, researcher, uh, two students now that are full time at the Center for Advanced Hindsight as behavioral researchers. Um, we have others that have behavioral types of titles, and then we have others that are more in the kind of the consulting realm. They're in consulting or strategy, so they're working for Boston Consulting Group or Deloitte, um, Grant Thornton, Navigant. They're working for the Army as a strategist. Um, also. Uh, more more, more uh, recent ones, so senior research analyst for J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, we have a, a student who's a Venture for America fellow, which is more entrepreneurial, helping with startups. The product manager at Visa, global risk manager at BRF, which is a Brazilian-based bank, um, a director at AMC Global, senior market a analyst for Pattern, and in many more areas. So. If we were to kind of figure out what types of titles and, and um, patterns are we seeing for students, uh, consultant, strategist, and analyst tend to be ones that, that are, are pretty common. Um, ones that have like behavioral scientist or, or behavioral science and there's something else following it, um, that's also fairly common in terms of titling. We're also seeing though, um, those that are going into user and customer experience, uh, management, finance, and other kinds of domains. Um, you can check out, and we'll be updating this um, in, the, in the months ahead, um, definitely before the February 1st deadline, some really cool student alumni stories, um, where, where they're at now, what they did, what, what they thought about the program, um, and they're also, um, so you can kind of get a, a diverse feel for the types of students and, and uh, who joins us. 
And then um, finally, so that I can leave time for some questions, um, the, w run down the kind of the admissions process. Again, this is available on our website. Uh, February 1st is the admissions deadline. Uh, we do not have rolling admissions, so there's no competitive advantage of getting in um, before February uh, before the February 1st deadline. Um, but uh, it, it's always helpful to get you know you can always get your materials in. It will not be reviewed until after February 1st, but you're welcome to get it in. Um, the the portal is open now. We look at very closely. The admissions committee looks at your personal statement. So how do you think about behavioral science? Why do you want to be a? Um, why do you want to join us at Penn? What do you think you might want to do with behavioral science? Um, talk about your trajectory, kind of where you came from, where you want to go. We look very closely at your official transcripts, um, especially your most recent year or two in school. If you were, if you had some graduate schooling, um, or have a graduate degree, we'd look at that as well. It's optional; you don't have to have a graduate degree to join us, but some do. We look very closely at your resume. So, what, what have you done? Um, uh, what, what have you been doing, um, both in industry, or, or have you done any internships? What kinds of jobs have you been doing? What kind of skill sets do you have? We look at your letters of recommendation. Um, we really don't look at your GREs or GMATs, so they're optional. Um, and the reason why they're optional is they're not terribly predictive of success in a program like ours. And it's also, um, you know, making somebody that's been in industry for a number of years study for and, and spend a lot of money on a test that doesn't have a whole lot of predictive validity of your success in a program like ours is, um, is, is why we really de-emphasize it. If you have it and you want to bring it into your package, your application package, you, there is an option to submit it. But it is, it is not something that is weighed um, um, or, or looked at all, all that much by our admissions committee. And then also, if you're an international student, you have to make sure that you ha leave plenty of time to get your transcript um, certified through either WES um, or through Certifile. Um, that can take several weeks. And so I would definitely make sure, if you are looking to apply to a program and you're international, that you're giving yourself enough time and by you know early December, um, you're giving lots of time for a February 1st deadline. You can do it through the portal, so you don't have to get West certification necessarily. Um, if, if you apply, you can use the certifile process, which kind of streamlines it a little bit. It may save a few days of, of time if you go that way. And then as an international student, if you're coming from a university where the, um, uh, you may need a, like a TOEFL score, of, of English is not the primary language. So that's something that we look at as well. So with that in mind, um, this is our kind of interactive component. We'll leave some time for some questions. Um, and if we don't get to all of your questions today, I've, I've posted our email address that you can reach out to us so that we can follow up with, with myself and our team. Um, also our website, our, our LinkedIn and Twitter accounts that you can look at and follow and, and for, for next steps. So. Um, with that in mind, do people have questions about the process um, or about the program that I can kind of help address and ask, uh, answer? I'm also looking to where people are streaming from still. So we have people coming from China and New York and D.C. and California and Ohio. So thanks for joining us. There's something that I did not cover that would be useful. Um, let me know um, in the chat box and I can answer that. Um, I will say something about our alumni. Um, given that our program is, is uh, relatively short, right? So it's a one calendar year program, we're, we're constantly finding ways to keep our alumni engaged. And so we're working to pilot a, um, uh, uh, where our alumni get kind of paired with our incoming students to help mentor them going forward. We also want to use the Action Design Philly um, meetups to have our alums come back and talk. Um, we've already brought back, five, I think, four or five alumni this year already um, to talk and mentor with our students. So that is, that is definitely um, an area that we're really looking to um, utilize. We have such great alums, we want to keep them involved. OK, we've got some questions coming in. Um, acceptance rate of the program is a really tricky question. We're still new and in startup land, so I can give you some basics. So in year one, we had about uh, 100 applicants for about 40 spots. In year two, we had, I think, 270 applicants for um, 60 or 70 spots. And um, this most recent cohort, we had about 350 applicants um, for about 80 spots. 
And so we definitely are getting more and more um, applicants, and the quality of the applicants are really, really, really high. Uh, we're looking for a, a, a diverse group. So we don't want only students coming from undergrad. We don't want only uh, industry oriented or only psych majors. Um, we want really diverse representation to kind of go out into behavioral science and help shape the field. So it is definitely competitive, um, but you would get a very careful review from the, the committee. Word limit for a personal statement? No, there isn't. Um, being a bit succinct is helpful. Um, so not going into you know numerous pages on and on and on. But I think whatever whatever you need to kind of tell your story. Where did you come from? Why is the program right for you? How did you get interested in behavioral science? Where, what do you think you might want to do with it? So however long that may take you to to articulate that. Um, that, that would be good use of your time. Also, if there is, there is something notable, so, so we have a GPA requirement. You have to have a, a GPA of at least 3.0 um, as your cumulative final GPA as, a, as an undergrad um, for consideration. If there were some like reasons for a low GPA, maybe your first year or two or something happened, you can add that into your personal statement so that the committee can at least review it and, and give a careful review. If you don't meet that 3.0 kind of criteria, um, it, it's, it's very unlikely that you would, you would make it to the next round. Um, so that, that is um, something that they do look at. Um, but if, if your like, most recent two years of GPA is above 3.0, um, even if your cumulative isn't, or maybe you did some grad graduate work um, and you have a GPA in graduate school that is much higher than when you're undergrad, those will definitely be weighed um, and, and um, factored into the conversation. Um, CV, uh, I think the, the, the one page resume kind of approach, being more of a professional based program, might be um, preferred, but we have had students submit like more academically oriented CVs. Um, I'm thinking of the, the hundreds and hundreds of applicants that apply to us selfishly. I like the one pages. And, and we have our students do them for um, the job market. We do a lot of resume reviews, so I think a resume would be slightly preferred. Um, can speak a little bit about students who are offered interviews, the purpose they serve. Okay, so we um, honestly, we have a capacity issue with the number of interviews that, that we're able to do. Um, it's definitely something that um, if you seem like a good candidate um, and you tick off a lot of the boxes, it looks like it'd be somebody that we would want to be offering. That might be one way that it triggers an interview so that we have an opportunity to see if the fit is there, if the, there's mutual interest. Um, it might be if there is um, disagreement among the committee and, and, and we want additional information that might be missing or that just might be useful for us in the decision making process. So not everyone gets an interview. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really a capacity issue. Um, but there will be a subset of students that will get them for a number of reasons, either to determine fit or kind of to get uh, for clarification's sake. Uh, international applicants, uh, preferred source, translate undergrad scores. No, I, I do think from based off of student feedback from the last year, using Certifile, which was through the application portal that Penn has, that seemed to work a little bit better than WES. I know there was a number of issues um, for um, Chinese students in WES that was like a lot of delays. Um, you're free to pick whatever you want. Just make sure you leave enough time. We have to have that certification um, by the February 1st deadline or as soon as possible because we have our uh, academic committee um, admissions committee meets like February 2nd like the next day or, or that within the week so um, just make sure you give yourself enough time to, to get it in um, international students that, that complete degrees bachelor's degrees in the US yes your TOEFL requirement um, is waived good question um, if your West converted GPA and undergrad GPA differ sign significantly, um, we, we use what, what West tells us generally. It's kind of the way of standardizing it. If you feel like the, the West GPA does not reflect your GPA for some reason, we can, you can talk to the program about it. But we usually, whatever West tells us, as long as there's no inaccuracies, that's what we use. And you have an opportunity to see the West report. So if you see an inaccuracy, you can let us know. Uh, Part-time students, great question. So we, um, the, our cohort now about 75 students. We have about 11 or 12 part-time students. 
uh, in this third cohort, and then we have another 12 or 13 part-time students from the, from the years one and two cohorts, um, we are constantly finding ways to get them more involved. So these meetup events that we do in Philly, they're at night, and it's a great way for them to kind of interact with their peers. We um, share the, the email and communications of our part-timers who are taking classes so they can get involved that way. Um, we have them do some of these design challenges. They can be a part of them, particularly some of the external ones because they tend to be nights and weekends. Um, all of our core classes are at night. They're from five to, usually from five to eight or six to nine, um, once a week. Um, the electives on campus can vary dramatically, so sometimes they're um, in the mornings or a couple times a week. So um, we, we are a residential-based program. Most of our students are full-time, but we do have quite a vibrant kind of minority of, of part-timers that, that are getting more and more involved with us. Great question. Um, visiting campus, okay, great, another great question. So this is another kind of bandwidth issue. Our students are only here for a year, and so having like hundreds of prospective students visit before their application is in um, isn't entirely feasible for us yet. And so um, we, we definitely coordinate with students um, when they are accepted in the program to come and to sit in on our classes, um, meet with our students, kind of that approach. So we will assist in that process um, in the spring. If you want to take part in our action design meetups um, that, that are more Philadelphia based, you're welcome to do that and join. We will have a research celebration event um, in December, early December, that will highlight our students' work and that would be an opportunity to visit and, and meet with our students, so that would be a possibility. I also, um, in the weeks ahead, I have an online calendar system that we can get you access to. Uh, my Wednesdays are, will be more and more open for students to speak with me um, virtually, uh, by phone, or in person. So you can do an in-person meeting with me. Um, it's just I, I'm a bit protective of our students. They're, they're very busy with everything that they're doing. And so um, we don't have them doing prospective visits um, until spring when, when we, we give out uh, admissions offers. And, um, so that they can focus on their studies and design challenges and trying to make the world better. Um, February 1st being the deadline. Oh, um, so February 1st being the deadline, uh, admission offers tend to go out in um, er, the first rounds of them at least will start going out in early to mid-March. Um, that will give the kind of the first round of students the opportunity to kind of weigh the decision they will have until mid-April to, to um, accept or decline our offer. And then we will have a wait list um, that will be notified um, by, again, around, right around mid-March. Um, and that will, um, by, by mid-April, the waitlisters will be updated on their status and what's going on. And we hope to conclude the process by May, um, but it, it just it varies. We're still new to this. Good question. Um, let's see. I've been out of college. Um, yeah, so if, you, if you're a professional, if you've been a working professional for a number of years and you have a lot on your resume, you've done a lot of work, um, and you can articulate that really well on your resume, your, um, your, your previous schooling, your undergraduate schooling, maybe weighed um, less compared to um, if you're a student coming right out of undergrad, you have very little experience um, in the world, you have maybe one or two internships and not a whole lot else. Um, we definitely calibrate differently. So you're kind of compared against other undergraduate students. If you're, if you're an undergraduate student coming in, you're, if you're from that pool, or if you're from the professional pool, you're kind of compared on what skill sets do you have, what GPA do you have. And again, your, your GPA is, is maybe um, factored a little less heavily um, if you're coming from uh, industry. Great question. Grad GPA weighted more heavily than undergrad GPA. G great question. Um, we definitely um, look, we don't have any kind of formal formula for it, but if you did well in your like more junior and senior undergraduate schooling and the courses that you took in advanced courses, we see that quite favorably. And then if you have had an opportunity to take graduate classes, specifically relevant ones, um, and you did well with them, absolutely that, that would be beneficial to include in your transcript, uh, in your package, application package. Um, any other questions? I'm going to take one more and then um, again you're more than welcome. 
Um, so one letter, great, letters of, of recommendation. Uh, one from industry, if you are in industry, or if you're, an, uh, if you're an undergrad with kind of limited experience, one that can speak to your, like, your research skills or your, your work skills, and then have somebody else that can speak to your academic skills or your academic potential. So even if you've been in industry, they should be able to talk about like, your intellectual curiosity, um, how, how you think through strategy and problems. So um, you can go that way. If you're an undergrad with pretty limited experience, you can have two more academically oriented um, letters of recommendation. For those in industry, you can do kind of like one in one. Um, so I'm going to uh, conclude this session. It's been really great spending some time with you today. But please feel free to reach out to us. You have our contact information um, that will go to our program. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, I look forward to kind of continuing this conversation with you going forward. Um, thank you for joining the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences information session. Take care.